All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Carlin Giovanello, who is just up the coast in San Francisco. How are you doing, Carlin? I'm doing very well, John. Nice to see you. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Carlin is a coach, uh, a leadership coach, and you now um, work with the next door too, if I'm correct. I do. I had their uh, people learning in programs, which is very exciting. It's the first time that they've had anyone working on that. And so I like doing things for the first time. Yeah, fantastic. And what we're going to talk today about is vertical leadership. Um, so let's get straight into it. For those who might not understand, would you say vertical leadership? Just define that for us. Yeah, vertical leadership, I think, is so important in business today because it focuses on an understanding of not only the job to be done, but what are the capabilities required to do it? And since we are now in what we're calling a VUCA world, um, it means that we have to expand what is our capabilities for leadership. And so we not only have to develop these vertical skills, we have to figure out how to make sense of all the things that are becoming very complex around us and try to figure out some meaning within that complexity. So it's a lot about critical thinking. It's a little bit about gut instinct, shifting perspective, making sense, relating. Uh, and of course you've got opposable thinking and we want people to get comfortable with conflict because without that, we can't really drive past what is already known. And I think we need to get really comfortable in our leadership when it comes to making sense, trusting self and dissenting, but then consenting. Yeah, it's it's an interesting challenge uh, for people nowadays, especially in leadership positions, because on the one hand, you, I mean, you have, let's face it, but always been given a lot of advice from people and new theories and ways to do things. And now we're hearing, oh, you need to be authentic, you need to be vulnerable, you need to be all of this stuff. But it's often all done kind of, it's like a pendulum. It seems to swing one way or the other. But what you're talking about is something that seems to be far more rooted and more balanced, if you like. I would agree with that. I think one of the first lessons that I had in my own life, not in my career, but just you know, previous, prior to career is, I was studying um, in London at uh, King's College for a master's in war studies. That's a whole nother mm. conversation. <laughs> and uh, my professors there were saying to me, you know, it, they've tended to see that American students will work from a very remote capability, meaning they have been taught to memorize and they regurgitate and they're very good at it. But what they are trying to do at their university is to get people to really look and learn and decide based on their own experiences, based on how they perceive the learning, based on you know what their opinions are, because what will come from those ideas are something unique. And I kept that you know basically since I graduated the program, which is how can I look at something that so many other people have already taken a look at and bring something unique because my opinions and my experiences and my perspective are those completely uh, autonomous to me in the way that I have shown up in the world. And so to get people to see that they don't have to do what everyone else has done, because even though that maybe has worked for decades, especially in, in leadership philosophy and frameworks, that doesn't mean that there's not something that is much better and much easier. And as you use the word, it's more authentic. It's more true to how you are trying to describe something. If it makes sense to you, you're not regurgitating something that someone else has you know, already so well described and, and, and studied, but this is what's true to you. And that passion and that understanding comes through, which connects to people. It gets mm -hmm. people to want to listen to you and to, to, to have a relationship with you and to learn more. And I think those are the basis of uh, leadership that I'm talking about, because in the end, there's that um, little joke where they say, listen, if you're leading no one, you're really not the leader that we're thinking of when we think of that term. And so, you know, you do need to have people that follow. And so how can you represent yourself as a leader that people would want to do that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you, and you mentioned some of the, something else that was quite interesting there when you said about the conflict, the creative conflict, uh, shall we say, element or, or the, you know, getting into, you know, disagreeing, exploring, you know, challenging, all of that. I mean, those are things that, 
um, you know, we we kind of inherently know are good things, but they seem to have been pushed down a little where we've become a kind of conflict phobic, you know, so that we we tend to look for more agreeable, more consensus things from the outset as opposed to going through the, the creative conflict process. I think it really does depend on the situation. You know, my mom used to tell me all the time, you get more bees with honey. And I understand that, that you want to find connection points with people in order to have them start to absorb and be open to an opinion that's maybe different from their own. And again, even if you and I have the same opinion, the way that I would stress it or recommend it still will be different because again, mm -hmm. unique individuals. And yet there is this piece about what happens when we do disagree, when we do have alternative perspectives, how can we go from a no but to a yes and mentality? And I often will be correcting leaders in live conversation where they'll say, yeah, but we don't want to do that because this and that and the other and but this and but that. And I'll always just say, what if you changed the buts to ands? How does that build connectivity, even just from a one word change? And you'd be surprised the more repetitive that you are to, to having people say, be inclusive. What can you bring in and step? What are you trying to push out? That the perspective will start to shift, but it is a very soft approach at having hard conversations. And my background uh, in coaching comes from the premise of nonviolent communication or compassion, uh, excuse me, compassionate communication, which is a theory by Marshall Rosenberg, which just uses the person from an I perspective. So instead of me talking to you and saying, you do this and you do that, and I can't stand when you, you say, when I see or feel, you know, it makes me feel, or when I see and hear, it makes me feel because I value. And so there's this four-step process that people walk through where they're using themselves as the test case. And if you can do that, and then move forward with, and I see how your position could support that dot, dot, dot. You will find that there's just immediately even just a change in the energy. And most people can sense that. They say like, oh, there's positive momentum and things are starting to flow. You know, however you want to describe it, it still means that we've shifted the antagonism to being a more participant relationship. And that's when people start saying, let's figure something out together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the things that's uh, that's quite interesting um, as well is just the the confidence to to do this. I mean, because I think a lot of people self awareness. Maybe that's the better one that I should talk about first. Is I always come back to self awareness, and you probably come across this obviously in your coaching work a lot. Is you know, how to help people become more self aware? Because I do think self awareness is is the great liberating. Uh, undertaking you can get because when you become self-aware and unfortunately I will put my hand up and say unfortunately I learned that uh, far too late in life I wish I'd learned a lot earlier but when you work with people how do you help them with the self-awareness piece because I think that's the greatest inhibitor of, of, of progress you know I immediately wanted to direct that question back to you which was like what was your experience what was your aha moment that had you going like wow maybe I don't know myself as well as I thought I did um, to be honest, it was a culmination of things. I mean, I, I, it was just when on reflection and certain situations, looking back, I thought, you know, maybe I could have done these things a little bit differently. Maybe I could have, um, um, you know, I'm pretty vocal. Maybe I could have been less vocal at times and stuff, you know, whatever. So there was a lot, it was a lot of looking back and it was a lot of looking at what was working for me and what wasn't working for me and sort of coming to the conclusion of saying is that maybe sometimes the message the message got lost in the extraneous stuff that goes on. And I think that's can be focusing more on on who you're talking to as opposed to what, you know, focusing on on how your message is going to be received so much as just getting it out there, if you like. Yeah, I think what, what you mentioned that I think is so true for, I think everybody really is hindsight. It, it is mm -hmm. that 2020 and um, that comes with maturity, that comes with experience, that comes with age. But when I am working with someone, and it seems like the demographic of my clients right now are early 30s, uh, very senior level folks that work for tech startups. Mm -hmm. And what I appreciate about them is their willingness to observe their behaviors and the way that they are doing from different perspectives. So there's a, a style of coaching called balance coaching, which is Let's have the one problem sit here in the middle. 
but let's look at the problem from a lot of different lenses. And it could either be silly lenses, like what does a sunflower feel about, um, you mm -hmm. know, talent management? Or you can say, what would your boss say looking at this? What would your, you know, a member of your team say to this? What would a new employee say to this? So you're driving people to see an issue from alternate perspectives in order to say, and again, a lot of this is auditory processing. They say like, mm -hmm. why is coaching so powerful? You pay me to listen to you. I mean, that's, that's literally yeah. what it is. But when people can hear themselves speak out loud and they're very gently and at pivotal points asked to explain something further, that's when they have to take pause. They have to search within themselves and go, wait, do I agree with that? Was that something or am I just, you know, again, on remote kind of spouting out what other people are saying, or is there something else? And so when you start to scratch at the surface and just really genuinely asking a person, like, do you really believe that? Is that really mm -hmm. something you would practice? Would you change it if you had your way? What if you could scrap the whole system and start over? What would you keep and what would you change? You know, I think when people have the opportunity to be curious mm. and you as the coach allow a lot of space for that, like the essential part of this processing or problem solving is just to be as curious as possible. I think what that does is it opens the doors to just tasting and testing out things that you would have immediately discredited. And I actually have um, something that I tell every single one of my clients, I have post-its all over my office here, which you thankfully can't see. But one of them I always ask all new clients to write is the word fail in large block letters. And I have them write that because I repeat fail as frequent adventures in learning. And mm -hmm. I always say to clients, if you are not failing every day, then you're not doing your job. And whether that's in life or at your at your position at work, the the joy of failing should be a part of everything because it means you are really trying to experience something in as many different ways as possible to find the, the one that is best. And to do that, you have to be very self-aware that your idea is not going to be the best. Mm -hmm. You can't house and own every phenomenal idea, thought, and theory in the entire world. And so once you open yourself to that process of being curious, seeing different perspectives, having that balance, then conflict becomes something that is more a discussion point. Curiosity becomes you know, really aligned with empathy. And then people are really allowed that scope of vertical leadership to say, I want to sit and listen to other people because your idea is probably going to not only enhance mine, but maybe even mm -hmm. do that. No, no, absolutely. I, I love that. And I just wanted to go back to that point that you mentioned a, a moment ago about when when you really get people to reflect on on whatever the subject is and to see whether their their initial reaction is actually the one that they believe in. Because you're correct, we probably hold loads of views about things that we've, where we've inherited or we've just maybe we uh, took a cursory glance at something, but we've never given it a lot of deep thought. So it may not be what we really, truly believe. There's something that we often talk a lot about uh, in our coaching, which is the difference between something that is habitual and something that is self-actualized. And oftentimes when someone gives me an explanation, a definition, or a story that sounds so remote, so automated, they've told it dozens of times, if not hundreds of times, they literally aren't even listening to themselves say it anymore. That's the perfect opportunity for a coach to come in and say, you know, where did that idea first come from? Whose idea mm -hmm. do you think that was originally? How have you, you know, embraced someone else's opinion and therefore made it your own? But when you can get a person to realize that often a change management practice for self is to recognize something that is not your own, is to decide choice, mm -hmm. all about coaching, choice, 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 but to decide if you want to keep that, if you don't, how can you either rework it or toss it out and bring something new in, but you then habitualize something that is true to you, that works for you. You know, if you have children, that's going to be different of applying something to, you know, the person that created it doesn't have children because there's a time component in there. There's maybe an empathy component. There's maybe a youthfulness component, but it will be something different for another person. And so when you can ask someone the question of go back to the first time you use this. Was it yours or was it somebody else's? Do you love it? Is it serving you? 
and just walk them through those pieces. Once you've broken enough, we'll call them bad habits, but you know, habits mm -hmm. that somebody actually doesn't want to hold true to them anymore, then they're going to be much more open to saying, okay, well, what else don't I know that I don't know? And then again, that doorway of really curious, compassionate communication starts to happen because they want to be challenged on what they don't know anymore. But to get in that doorway, depending on the level of leader and or the level of self-awareness, it can be very challenging. And I think mm -hmm. people start to meet that resistance is when they go, oh, you know what? This isn't for me. I, I don't want to tangle with it because people can be very defensive when challenged about the origins of their knowing. And so right. it's a lot of empathy. I've used the words compassion and empathy, but to understand that someone is suffering a condition that makes them feel defensive. And so how can you still be there for them even when it feels like they're lashing out at you? They're not. They're lashing out at some um, approach into their way of being that feels like they're doing something wrong or that there could be a better, different way. That's, that's that's fascinating. Thank you for for raising that. That's 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 a fascinating fascinating insight. And the reality is, at the end of the day, let's face it. I mean, pretty much everything we know is inherited or learned knowledge from different things. And yes, yep. we put it together to discover other things. But it is an interesting thing because, as maybe as we go on leadership journeys, we start to assume maybe that more of it is proprietary, if you like, than it than mm -hmm. it really is. I will 100% agree with that. And I think the self-relating part of vertical leadership is really interesting because you are making sense of your own reactions, thoughts, and feelings. And even though someone can detail a process to you, if you can walk them back to you, what's the feeling that you have about it? How does it make you feel to see X happen? You know, what was your sense of feeling when, you know, Y was occurring? And once people can start to associate that, maybe the feeling and the action are disassociated. It becomes like, well, then why do I have that as, you know, my North star, where did that come from? And, you know, you say it so like, oh yeah, of course people will know like things came from other people in different origins. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how many people in very senior leadership positions don't know that and really do assume and believe that the way that they think and feel and behave is because they have designed it to be that way. And so again, the higher levels that you get, the more resistance that you get. Well, why would I change this work for me this far? Okay, is there a way that you think that, you know, it could be evolved so that you could work even stronger, better, faster in the future? And and here's just one other thing I wanted to touch on too. I mean, we have more generations in the workforce now than um, apparently we've ever had before. It's somewhere between four and five. I can't remember what the fifth one was, but an expert told me. So I believe it. But so there's many different generations in the workforce today. So as a leader, that's quite challenging the way different generations receive information, the way they perceive them, all of that kind of stuff. So when you're working with people, how do you help them uh, cope with this multi-generational workplace? OK, that's an excellent question, by the way. So kudos for, for surfacing that. There is going to be a base level of agreement to almost any conversation or dialogue, uh, even if it's just one thing. And you have to try and work with people to find out what that one thing is. So a lot of times we're lost in the weeds and we have so many processes and theories that we're trying to test out because they've worked before, they haven't worked before, we've never mm -hmm. tried it, be more open-minded, <laughs> stick to what works. You know, it, it gets very convoluted. If you can get people to break down basics, whether that's, you know, what is the end goal of this project? Do we all agree on that? There's a leadership framework that I will give a shout out to the Center for Creative Learn uh, Le uh, Center for Creative Lear Leadership, sorry, CCL, and it's called Direction, Alignment, and Commitment. And if you can have people break down really anything into what is the direction that we are all trying to go, do we have the processes and people in place in order to get that? That's the alignment piece. And then is the team strong enough to be able to do it? If you can have people agree on those three premise, it's going to be much easier to scale something, to have all of the logistics and or uh, different practices that people want to utilize because the goal, the process, and the people are all in agreement. But if you don't have that, you'll often find that someone's just so fixated on this one piece that they won't relent in any way to get involved in any other and so I always suggest to people like drop all of the frill 
and go down to what is core, what's the foundation, what's the structure. And if we can get people to do that, then often you'll find that they have much more commonalities. And again, I, I always use the one, um, listen, what's the one thing that everyone has in common in this room? And it's usually, you know, we're people. So mm -hmm. get down to basics. Yeah, no, I'm I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. I totally agree with that as well as, uh, you know, bring it down, keep it, strip it down to its basics. And you find that there's a lot more um, uh, commonality involved. So what was, uh, just before we end, what would be one, uh, one piece of advice you would give to leaders, you know, maybe as they're coming out of the pandemic, I know there's an inflation crisis on, but maybe as they see, maybe the future is is unfolding, but it's still not quite, not quite clear where it's going. What, what's one piece of advice you would have for them? It sounds as, as the most basic piece, but really being an active listener Mm -hmm. is so critical to understanding what knowledge is out there in the world for you to gather to make a best assessment, a best case use, uh, uh, a best uh, problem solution orientation. And I think what happens is that we often get so directive in the fact that we have to move quickly and answer tough you know, situations and we better know immediately how to solve something versus being able to give ourselves the grace to say, how can I ask some very open-ended, powerful questions and let other people bring to me what they've learned, what they've seen, what they've observed. Take all of that information and use my own very strong critical thinking skills in order to come up with something that is viable. Because I think the issue that we want to make sure we're having people address right now is you will not be able to start, stop multiple times on different projects before that project, that company, that team will fail. What you will need to do is you will need to get a lot of information on the back end so that if you're only gonna do it maybe a couple of times, there's that iteration process where you're not habitualizing something that was broken because you've listened enough to mm -hmm. hear that, oh, this is a commonality of you know, the negative aspect of failure and I don't think I'm gonna absorb that. But you have to give yourself the time to listen. And I think for a lot of leaders, they wanna share what their answers are, where I'm always asking them, you know, what's another question that you can listen to and, and kind of absorb that material. So again, super basic, and yet I think it's a game changer. Oh, I think it's a game changer without a doubt. I think uh, active listening and critical thinking are commodities that unfortunately are in short supply or shorter supply than they should be. That's for sure. So yeah, listen, yeah, listen, thank you. Um, thank you, Carlin. This has been a fantastic interview. But before we go, could you please tell people a little bit more about you and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for asking. So I am a leadership coach and a leadership developer, and I work primarily in the one-on-one -on -one space, but I do love to present keynotes to companies and to organizations to talk about vertical leadership, to talk about empathetic leadership. Uh, very similar to you know the work that Dr. Brene Brown does. I think there's so much um, juicy material that's involved in looking at leadership from different angles. And I want to go and try to help people see problems from different perspectives, but mostly to own their own ability to critical think and to assess that is unique to them. And so it's a, it's a very rewarding field. And I think I apply that both, you know, in the business world and just even being a, a wife and a mother. So um, I thank you so much for letting me have just a little bit of chat time on air yeah. to talk about things I love. Yeah, it's been fantastic. And it's a big, big advocate for coaching. I would uh, encourage you to go check out Carlin's work. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you need a person who is a third party whose only investment is in your success. They don't That's have it. the emotion. They don't have all the other stuff, the baggage, whatever. It's not a family member. It's not a friend. It's a coach. It's somebody who just yep. wants you to be your best. Yep. So... So listen, thanks again, Carlin. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll talk to you again soon. Yes, take care, everybody. Thank you so much, John. Bye-bye.